The men were thrown into space like a dozen wriggling silverfish. They were scattered into a dark sea, and the ship, in a million pieces, went on, a meteor swarm seeking a lost sun. Death is inevitable in Outer Wilds. It waits beyond every atmosphere, at the bottom of every cliff, in the ghostly auras on every planet. It's in your oxygen levels, your ship's reactor, your local weather. It's at the center of your sun. You can pretend death doesn't exist in Outer Wilds for a while. It's what I did in my first go-round. I was exceptionally careful in taking off and landing. I talked to every person, I gleaned every bit of information, I practiced floating and falling, I planned my first space flight. And when I finally left the town I was born in and the planet I was born on, I flew my way over to a neighboring world, gently touched down, looked up, and saw the sky exploding. Death is inevitable in Outer Wilds. Your solar system is a ticking time bomb. Generations were born, lived, and died, not knowing that the sun would eventually destroy their world. It didn't particularly matter to anyone before today. But that unstoppable supernova does matter to me, the person who achieved their lifelong dream of becoming an astronaut minutes before annihilation. It matters to the scientists who have spent their lives trying to unravel the mysteries of the universe and were inches away before they saw it all destroyed. It probably matters to the kids who just want to play hide and seek, the elders who have seen astronauts like me come and go, the explorers who have taken up residence on other planets. It probably matters to them too. Although they don't know it. They fell. They fell as pebbles fall down wells. They were scattered as jackstones are scattered from a gigantic throw. And now, instead of men, these were only voices, all kinds of voices, disembodied and impassioned, in varying degrees of tenor and resignation. Death is inevitable in Outer Wilds, and it's not just inevitable once. Every time I die, through suffocation or explosion, I wake up in the same place. Back home, back next to this campfire, I'm stuck in a loop. In the mind of everyone else, I've never even taken off. I'm groundhog daying and no one else knows it. And no matter what I do, no matter how many planets I visit or translations I read or kids I play hide and seek with, we're still only one tick away from the end of the solar system. But I explore anyway, because maybe someone had found a way to stop that supernova. Maybe there's a key that hadn't been turned, or a puzzle that's almost been solved, and just not quite. But who knows how many times I've woken up in the same place. I can only build my map of the universe a couple minutes at a time, but I can live those minutes over and over and over, learning more every time before the sun eventually explodes. I try to get used to it. Exploration is dangerous and death comes easily. Once I'm exploring caverns deep underground when I notice they're slowly filling with sand. I get lost among the stalagmites and tights and I get flattened against the ceiling of the cave. Once, twice, a dozen times, I try to land on the space station that's incredibly quickly orbiting the sun. It never goes well. Once, I land on a hollow planet with a black hole at its center. In seeming defiance of the obvious danger, a previous civilization built power plants, temples, and even schools into the ceiling, but were long past their mastery, and now asteroids are bombarding the outside of the world, sending massive chunks of rock and architecture down into the void. I wander those dangling caverns for a while before I miss a jump and plummet down into the black hole myself, I take a breath. Another death, another chance. But it's not death. It's a wormhole that takes me to the outer reaches of the solar system. I'm alone, floating among the wreckage that's also been warped into the void. I do my best to keep up with it. I find a piece of a house, destroyed, gently bumping into asteroids. 
Inside is a quiet love note to someone I'll never meet. I'm trying as best I can to manage my jetpack fuel and my oxygen, but they're both falling so fast. My fuel goes first, and my suit helpfully informs me that it will now use my remaining air as a propellant. I spy one distant, brightly lit building and drift towards it. I'm trying to barely move. Any adjustment depletes my slivers of remaining air. I reach it. And I realize this isn't just random debris, this is intentional. This building is here on purpose. I hold my breath and float inside. Oh my god, it's aerated. There are trees in here. There's oxygen. I'm not going to die. A sign tells me that I'm not the first to fall through this wormhole, but not to worry. This building is actually a teleporter. It will send me right back to the hollow planet I originally landed on. All I have to do is wait for orbit to align them again. So I do. I wait. I stand there, looking up, waiting to swing back into view of the planet my ship still waits on, waiting to be shot back to the universe to continue my journey. But as time spins by, I have the creeping realization that I'm never making it back. I was too late. The teleporter will never work for me. And as I realize this, I hear the sun contract and explode, and then I look up and I see white light bathing the top of this building I thought was my salvation. And then I look down and it doesn't matter anymore. When life is over, it's like a flicker of bright film, an instant on the screen, all of its prejudices and passions condensed and illumined for an instant on space. And before you could cry out, there was a The film burned to a cinder, the screen went dark. Death is inevitable in Outer Wilds, but so is beauty. I mean, it's right there, right when you start. A brilliant flash of blue lightning, a planet soaring slowly overhead, the comfort of a warm campfire. And that's before you've even moved. On the other side of the planet I was born on, there are geysers that shoot huge gouts of steam into the sky. There are twin planets locked in an infinite dance, swinging around one another, when I'm standing on one, I feel like I'm inches from the sun. There's a giant that hides countless tornadoes under its serene surface gases, tearing the planet's ocean surface into an endless fury. There is land on this giant, but it's not immune either. The first time I stood on a beach here, I watched as a storm approached, engulfed me, and threw the entire island into space. Suddenly the sky was clear and black, everything around me gently floating. The sounds of the storm were gone. We float for a second above everything, and then we fall back into the sea. More than any individual touch though, what I can't get over is the movement of everything. The skies are alive in outer wilds. They're so alive. They'll dart past you and roll over you and shift beneath your feet. The biggest part of learning to pilot your ship in Outer Wilds is just understanding the mechanics of keeping up with a planet as it tears through space. You're trying to hit a moving target from a moving target. It's intense. And even once your feet are on the ground, the game won't let you forget this cosmic merry-go-round. Have you ever got seasick from watching the sun's orbit? I have. Now. Nothing is static. Back on the bombarded hollow planet, I fall towards the black hole again, but this time I manage to send myself into a last ditch orbit around it instead. And somehow, miraculously, I swing all the way around, landing gently on an outcropping shared by... someone else? I can't believe it. I talk to him in a rush. What does he know? Where are we? What can I do? I'm just a few sentences in though when I hear it. I hear it first, and then I see it, the streaks of light burning across the sky. 
I realize I can actually see the sun exploding through the holes in this hollow planet. This wasn't fair. I explored, I learned, I inexplicably survived. The universe ends anyway. Death is inevitable in Outer Wilds. It was so very odd. Space, thousands of miles of space, and these voices vibrating in the center of it. No one visible at all, and only the radio waves quivering and trying to quicken other men into emotion. Once I land on a destroyed station, high in orbit above the gas giant, I'm proud of myself for pulling this landing off. So proud, in fact, that when my ship gets jostled off the station and quickly disappears from view, I'm okay with it. My day will end the same way regardless. I explore the station, a fascinating floating catastrophe, destroyed by the energy of whatever it was trying to do. There's one place I can't reach from the inside. I can see the hallway. I want to go down, but it's blocked by debris, and so I make another plan. It's just a little spacewalk. All I have to do is leave the station, use my jetpack to fly down, and enter in the other side. Risky, but doable. As I'm preparing for my space flight, I look into the distance at the sun. It's much farther than it is from my home planet, but through the atmosphere of the gas giant and the miles of empty space, it's still beautiful. And then I look back and realize the space station has drifted away from me. And I laugh this time. Death is inevitable after all. And as I go into my own orbit around the planet, my zero-g version of a lazy river, I take the time, ironically, to breathe. If you'd believe it, it's incredibly relaxing. I've died from blunt force trauma. I've been eaten, crushed, burned, punctured. To drift off in this gentle void, it's not too bad at all. Outer Wilds isn't just about your death, though. It's the death of civilizations. Across the planets in the solar system, I found great cities in the most impossible of places. They were filled with writing, stories about scientific discoveries, but also of the minutia of everyday life. These communities had technology far more advanced than anything I've seen on my quiet home planet. They were scholars and terraformers and artists. Of course, they're all dead too. Dead long before I got there. The sound of voices calling like lost children on a cold night. I start to learn more about them, though. About their theories of the universe and scientific hypotheses and the machine they built. A machine built to send someone back in time after their death. And just as I'm barely beginning to grasp how I might be involved in all this, I find myself transported to an invisible lab in the center of a planet, with more text I just don't have the context for, and more machines powering technology I couldn't even guess at, but without considering any of that I manage to open the core to this machine and pull out the power source. It seems important, so I don't leave it behind when I go. I'm halfway back to my ship when I realize what I'm holding. They, whoever they are, built a machine to send things back in time. I, someone who had been mysteriously sent back countless times, found a time machine, cracked it open, and removed the power source. I look in dread at the angry red sun, already swelling. Death is inevitable. From this outer edge of his life, looking back, there was only one remorse, and that was only that he wished to go on living. Did all dying people feel this way, as if they'd never lived? Did life seem that short, indeed, over and done, before you took a breath? Did it seem this abrupt and impossible to everyone, or only to himself, here, now, with a few hours left to him for thought and deliberation? Kaleidoscope is a 1949 story by Ray Bradbury. In it, a group of astronauts are thrown apart by a collision with some celestial object. 
They're miles apart instantly, getting further away from each other all the time, but they can still hear each other. They can still talk. And as they spin into space, each one experiences a different kind of cosmic embrace. One man is confident he'll hit the moon, one is entangled in a swarm of tiny asteroids which sweep him into a long and distant orbit. The main character is sent back towards Earth. His last thoughts are that he wants to matter, wants to do something meaningful, wants to do just one good thing. He burns when he hits the atmosphere. On the ground, a child looks up and screams, a shooting star. Still holding the core of the time machine, I do the only thing I can think of. I climb into my little spaceship, lift off, and head towards home. I touch down on my little green planet, landing exceptionally carefully, though I couldn't really tell you why. I wish the sun would explode right then. Beautiful. Poetic. I touch down moments before being incinerated. But it didn't. I stand on the planet for an uncomfortably long time, watching the sky. Nothing has stopped moving. In fact, I have to keep getting on my ship and moving because the sun is drifting beyond the horizon. Nothing stops moving, even in its final moments. It feels like I wait forever. In reality, it's about three minutes. And I don't know this at the time, but later on, I'll discover even more about the nature of the universe, the practicality of the warp core, the virtue and splendor of sacrifice, the never-ending cycle of life. Later, I won't spend a minute waiting. I'll be an experienced and confident spacefaring being and know exactly what to do and where to go. Later, I'll be satisfied, content, at ease despite everything. But it's not in this life, and it's not in this timeline, because finally, finally, the sun contracts, and then the sun explodes like I've seen dozens of times. And this time I'm afraid. This time I know I've dug my own grave with the energy core I hold in my hand. This time, I look at the supernova, and I start to run. There were only the great diamonds and sapphires and emerald mists and velvet inks of space, with God's voice mingling among the crystal fires. 